Hello and welcome to Life Changes Online. This is Tyler. This is Michael. And, and we'll, we'll be hosting, hosting you today. today. We want to say a massive welcome if you're joining us for the first time. It's such an honor and privilege to host you. If you are joining us on Facebook or Instagram, we want to invite you to join us on our online platform, lifechangeschurch.tv. This is the space where we're able to host you best. We have teams ready to pray with you, connect with you, and you can be part of our incredible online community. If you are joining us on Facebook, why don't you click like on the pinned comment and our team would love to connect with you. With you where you can find out a little bit more about Life Changes Church. If you're wondering how do I stay connected at yeah. this time, we've created a platform called Life Group Live. Yeah. These are our usual life groups that would be meeting in homes all across our city, except they meet on the Zoom platform. And this is a great way to stay connected, yeah, to is. make friends. Actually, imagine finishing lockdown and making a new friend during this time. So what we'd love to invite you to do is on our lifechangeschurch.tv platform, click the groups tab where you can sign up and we'll connect you into one or visit our website there's also a space where you can sign up for a life group live on our website. We are going to worship together now. I'm so excited to worship, Mike. Why don't you help us understand how we can engage during this time? Well, even though we aren't meeting in a building, we still want to posture yeah. our hearts towards Jesus. So why don't you stand with us? Even though it may yeah. be awkward, we want to worship our Savior together yeah. and make the most of this moment. Our Father, we thank you that we have the opportunity to worship together at this time. Yeah. Thank you, King Jesus, that we as people were designed to worship your name. We yeah, choose in this moment, God, to take our eyes off our circumstances and fix our eyes on the name of Jesus, yeah, who is worthy you, of our worship, worthy of our praise, worthy of our adoration. So we posture ourselves yeah. now, King Jesus, towards you and we ready ourselves to worship the King of Kings. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Let's worship together. Still, still hearts beat. 
what a special time of worshiping together. It's so amazing that we still get to have these moments even in lockdown. Yeah. There are two things we'd love to make you aware of at this time. The yeah. first one is our giving page. If you would like to partner with us in what we yeah. are doing as a local church, we'd love to direct you on our website. There is a tab where you can click give and that'll give you all the information you need and all the avenues that we have available for you to be able to partner yeah. with us at this time. The next thing is we want to remind you about Life Group Live. This yeah. is a moment where you can stay connected yeah. and make new friends. So why don't you hop up to our website Hit the Life Group Live tab and you can get yeah. connected during this time. Come on, really excited for this weekend. It's church yeah. and we know if it's church, we are going to have a word and it's a good one. Come on, somebody. Oh, I like it. Today we have Mark VP, the one and only Woo. preaching and it's we're really excited for this. So if you don't have a notebook, go get a notebook. If you don't have a pen, use a pencil. But we want to engage. We want to um, be part of the word. And so we're really excited for this. We're really excited for yeah. the word that Mark has on his heart. So get ready, get set and let's receive the word together. everyone and welcome to church. It is so good to be together. My name is Mark and I have the privilege of being one of the pastors at this amazing church, Life Changes Church. We have had the privilege of being on a week's leave. Who takes leave in lockdown? Well, we did and we needed it. And as a family, we've loved it. And we want to say thank you to the teams that have been running so hard and making everything work so well. Um, we enjoyed flapjacks from our one neighbors and our other set of neighbors helped us with DIY the whole week. So we've been spoiled. Our boundary lines have fallen in pleasant places. We're learning lots through this lockdown, early morning cycles with the family, trying to keep the boys in queue while you pedestrians spread out across the whole road, taking it up. Thank you. Um, no, we've loved it. We've enjoyed it. We're enjoying every moment of it. Uh, there are challenges and there are trials like homeschooling and home haircuts. As you'll notice, the lockdown here is getting wilder and wilder. But all of that aside, we love what God is doing. And we've had some interesting moments. We had a small kind of concussion moment, shall we call it that? One of our, we had a rope over the pool. One of my boys decided to swing on it and we just heard the most massive thump as his head hit the pavement, but he bounced back and he's fine. Thank you for the concern. Don't worry. He's all checked out and all good, but it's been fun. I want to just say this though, we miss you. It's not just a statement like we're hiding behind the cameras, we're enjoying this as the best, we're giving it our best, but we know the best will be when we come together again, we sing and worship together again. The last time we met was our 21st celebration where we got to celebrate 21 years of God's goodness and kindness to us. And at the time we know we were speaking about the promises that He had for us and the abundance that He had for us. And none of that has fallen away, God keeps pouring it out. But we continue at this time, and I want to just say before we jump in, I want to say thank you for your generosity and your consistent giving into the life and the financial story of Life Changes Church. Through that giving, we are continuing to be able to serve our city and our nation as best as possible, to be the best church we can be for the city, to invest in areas like the West Coast COVID Fund, giving to people within our community and making sure that we are playing our part in the challenges of our nation at this time. So thank you for your giving. For those who normally give in cash, Please go online and find out how to give electronically or SnapScan or the many different ways that we can give at this time. But today, we continue, and we don't just continue, we do the final installment of our series called Are You Crazy? A series of finding faith in times of fear. What does it mean to find faith, to find a currency of faith, that we can be people who deal in faith, not fear? and not fear-mongering, a people who deal in faith and speak a language of faith 
over our nation and over this world at this time so that people, when people are in our presence, they find courage and faith and hope in Jesus, that we would find the resilience of faith, that even when the chips are looking bad and everything's looking down, we find resilience in our faith in Jesus Christ, His person, His power, and all in, that He is to us at this time. We find the results of faith, that we want to see signs and wonders in this time and the greatest way we can do that is by living a life of faith. But to do all of that, we have to find faith. So I want to speak today, and here's the title of our message. They're watching you. No, not another conspiracy. No, not some beam from the sky that is watching you. Though they're watching you. You ever get that feeling that somehow someone's watching you? Maybe on your Zoom calls. I've been on one or two interesting Zoom calls. I was on a Zoom call with about 120 pastors and their wives from around the world. And there's always that one guy. I don't know if you know, but you've probably had them on your Zoom calls. That one guy who just never seems to be able to turn his mic off. He thinks he's on mute. He starts shouting out, honey, honey, get the kids to shut up, please. And you're trying to listen to some profound speaker from somewhere in the world who's pouring his guts out and this guy's shouting over him or the guy who's dressed up for business on top but stands up, forgets the cameras on and it's party at the bottom. We all know that that's the reality. It's the corona times and the Zoom phenomenon of our time. But my wife and I have been watching a series together. We don't often find series that we enjoy, one called Colony, and it's a whole bunch of intrigue and conspiracy, and they're a part of the resistance, and I don't want to give it all away, but there's always the sense that someone is watching them. The camera angles show that as they're walking down the street, someone's watching from a bush, or as they're walking and driving down the road, some beamy up Scotty antenna is watching them from the skies. Sometimes, don't you get the feeling someone's watching? Well, the Bible says that actually is the case. The Bible says there are these witnesses. Hebrews 12 tells us these witnesses who've got their amazing faith stories, these enduring faith stories of themselves. And it's, it's a whole bunch of amazing heroes of the faith that are mentioned through Hebrews 11 of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Sarah, and, and Re Rebecca, I mean Rahab, and Gideon, and Samson, and Simeon, and all these guys, Samuel and David, they all mentioned as these heroes of their faith with their massive faith stories behind them. But they're watching us. The writer of Hebrews says they're watching us. He includes himself for, as, as someone being watched by these heroes of the faith and shouting out, this is our hero. Hebrews 12 starts, the very first verse of the Hebrews 11, which is a continuation of the chapter for the first two verses. It says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, not spectators, not conspiracy people, witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. It suggests they are witnesses. They are there to watch our journey and one day, should there ever be a court we are called to to say, what was the faith of Mark Levin Pletson like? And they'll bring in the heroes of the faith who were witnesses to my story and they'll say, well... Considering Samson maybe sitting there going, considering my eyes were gouged out, he moaned a lot about not being able to go for a walk at 11 in the morning. I mean, think about some others. Uh, think about Abraham and, and, uh, and having to be willing to sacrifice his son Isaac and trust God in the journey of that sacrifice. Well, maybe during the corona times, he moaned a lot about homeschooling. I don't know, but these are a tough crowd of witnesses, but the Bible says they are there cheering us on. And they're not there to pull us down. They're there to say, actually, we did it. And we were ordinary people who found faith in a glorious, faithful God. So we achieved the things we did. You can do it too. I want to tell you that today. As we sum up this series, it can be done. And it's done by keeping our eyes on Jesus. But in these times and in most difficult times, the biggest thing people spend most of their time doing is looking for answers. Why are things so tough? Where is God in all this? What's the big story here? What's the conspiracy? Is Bill Gates the Antichrist? What about Donald Trump and that hair? We don't know all the answers to all these crazy questions. But I'm not sure that's what we're supposed to be spending our time on. People are giving a lot of time to social media and conspiracies. And is this all information? I would posture to you today. You should be spending most of your time fixing your eyes on the author, the perfecter 
the pioneer and finding faith in his eyes at this time. So we're gonna look at these witnesses that are presented through Hebrews 11 and the story they present firstly is they present, they had a heavenly hope. It says this in Hebrews 11 verse 13. All these people, these heroes of the faith were still living by faith when they died. They, they never gave up. They navigated all their trials. They navigated all the enemies, all the opposition, everything that came. And when they died, they were still living in faith. They were on their deathbed going, God, you can still do it. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of that country they left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them. See, these people, the Bible says, they accepted that they were foreigners and strangers in this world. They accepted that there was a future hope, a future city which their king was preparing for them. And in accepting that, it found them an ability to navigate and understand that or not all their hopes and dreams are meant to be met on this side of eternity. Maybe that's what's the biggest wrestle in your life. Maybe something like owning a home has been the thing and generations has been the thing for your family and all of a sudden you are faced with the reality you might not be able to afford to own a home. And I want to tell you that is hard and it's tough and it's a trial and it's many things, but your home is established in Jesus forever and no one can ever take that away from you. It refers to these great heroes and the writer of Hebrews is speaking to them even before in Hebrews 10 and he's challenging them in verse 34 or 32. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you endured such a great conflict full of suffering. Oh, what a big word, the S word. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So you did not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. They joyfully accepted the confiscation of their property. As the persecution rained down on them and the suffering existed in their lives, they joyfully accepted because their joy was not in the things of this world. Their, joys was in, their joy was in a heavenly hope. The fact that they weren't, foreign, they weren't of this place, they were foreigners at this time. I remember one of my most frustrating moments as a 20-year-old, 19-year-old, I went home and the sheriff of the court was coming the next day to liquidate us, to take everything, our home, our cars, our family pictures, everything. And I walked into the house and my mom greeted with a smile and she started saying things like, it's gonna be okay, God is with us, God has always been faithful. And I remember not having the revelation of God's goodness and kindness at the time, going, how can you be so full of joy? Joy just happens to be her name as well. How can you be so full of joy at this time? But you see, since I was a little kid, I remember waking up and the first thing I saw was my mother reading her word. She could joyfully accept the confiscation of her property on this side of eternity because she had a heavenly hope which was higher. In these times, you need a heavenly hope. If you want to walk with the witnesses of Hebrews 11 cheering you on, find a heavenly hope. Secondly, they understood suffering in this life. Here's a description of some of their stories. Hebrews 11 verse 36. You're not going to like this one. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were, they were killed by the sword. I nearly said grilled. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were also commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. So the writer of Hebrews again 
He, 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 doesn't, he doesn't say to find faith and to live in faith is to never encounter suffering. He says, no, the opposite. He says, no, finding faith means there'll be persecution, there'll be challenge, there'll be death. He's saying, and he's writing to a church that had given their lives before, but they are facing challenge and trial. They become weary of doing good and they are contemplating compromising the gospel. He's writing to that church. He's reminding them of their faith. He's reminding them of the heroes of the faith. And then he's calling them to faith. He's saying, your witnesses that are watching your journey, that are cheering you on, they're not surprised by challenge or trial or even suffering. They're not surprised today in the middle of Corona 2020. See, too many of us are so surprised by that and we are so disconnected from any form of suffering. The church in the Middle East, I phoned a friend of mine, he says the church is thriving. Why? Because they've lived under pressure and suffering for decades. The church in China are thriving. The church in areas of the world that have known hunger and thirst for many years and generationally, the church is thriving. Why? Because the believers had a resilience inside them because they've embraced suffering as part of life. And too much of the first world and the privileged world and the suburban world cannot embrace a concept of suffering. So we have to label it something like persecution. This is persecution. This is not persecution of the church. This is a health issue and the governmental realities. Oh, Mark, it's a conspiracy. It doesn't have to be a conspiracy. And I'm happy to be proved wrong, but I don't think there's some alien force speaking into our world. I think there's something called a virus that has been dealing in the world and somehow God will use it. And somehow God will train us and train us and, and understand this, we have a God who knew suffering. It says, actually in 1 Peter 5 verse 10, and after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory. You see, in the light of eternity, this life is a little while. One year, how long will we be around? How long will we face challenges? When will we meet again? I don't have the answers for those things. I'm not saying I'm enjoying it. I'm saying God is at work. And if we don't see his hand and we don't recognize his word that tells us there will be suffering, we're gonna miss his plans in this story. It says, he has called you to his eternal glory in Christ. He will restore, himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. You need to be restored you need to be strengthened. You need to be established at this time. Well, it'll happen in Christ's hand. When we understand that we worship a king who suffered and died for us. It challenged us in Romans 5, the writer of Romans writes, not only so, but we will also glory in our sufferings. Oh, Mark, but that's Old Testament stuff. No, this is Romans. This is the book of grace. This is about the truth of the gospel. Getting us, we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces something. It has a fruit. The fruit is perseverance. Perseverance produces character and character produces hope. You need hope right now. Well, allow character be formed by suffering and perseverance in your life. God's forming something. He's fashioning a warrior, a hero of the faith at this time. If we'll find courage and we'll find language of faith at this time. See, God is speaking. And church, it's time to understand that suffering, and maybe a new word I'll introduce, a hardship in this life, produces a fruit, produces something that makes us more like Jesus. You see, we sing these songs glibly at church. Oh, to be like you. To give all I have just to know you. We've sung that song so many times. And yet that journey is not an easy journey. And I'm only 41 years old and it's my 16th anniversary today. I watched my wife navigating a health hardship month after month, year after year. And I watched Jesus being formed in someone I love. And then he started to deal in my life. And I didn't like it. And I started to kick against it. And then I read his word and his word reminds me. I'm never going to be sheltered of these things on this side of life because God is fashioning something in someone who looks more like his son than he did the day before. Thirdly, I want to tell you that these heroes of the faith had something called enduring faith. 
not fair weather faith. It works when it's good and works when it's round. We can shout, we're the top of the mountain and hashtag blessed. No, this is not fair weather faith. This is enduring faith. It looks like this, Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance. There's a race to be run with perseverance that is marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. He says, actually, get rid of the sin that so easily entangles. We don't know what specific sin he's speaking about, but we know that this is a church that is losing their faith, so he's presented the heroes of the faith. I think he's speaking to the sin of unbelief. The fact that we've believed, seen miracles, and now we're choosing to not believe. He's challenging the sin of unbelief. He says, it'll entangle you. It'll pull you down. Find faith in this time. See, you're a people, the Hebrews people, you've known challenge and trials for generations. They were not New to trials. They weren't new to challenge. They just got tired. They got weary. Have you got tired and weary? Well, he says, actually, go on that journey. Understand there's a race to be run. Jesus had a prize inside of him, so he endured the pain and the process of the cross because the prize was you. The prize was your family. The prize was your freedom. The prize was your joy. The prize was your life. There's a prize in our race too, and the prize is Jesus. The prize isn't justice for injustice. The prize isn't truth to a conspiracy. The prize isn't a convenient, comfortable life where everything will be dandy for 70, 80 years and then we die and go to heaven. That's not the prize. The prize is Jesus. And we remember the prize. We understand we had a suffering king who suffered and died for us and he called us to a life that said, it's gonna have trials, it's gonna have challenge. Do not grow weary. Consider Jesus. Do the maths. Look at his life left the perfection of heaven into the womb of a woman to come to die for us, an innocent man. He, 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 three times he enters Gethsemane. He says, Father, not, not my will, but your will be done. Please take this cup from me, please. It's okay to pray that prayer, but you've got to land in the same space. He lands, and the only way you'll land there is with enduring faith, saying, God, I believe you, I trust you, even when it doesn't make sense. I know that you are working. And Jesus sits in Gethsemane. His mates keep falling asleep. He's facing challenge and trial. He says, Father, not my will, but your will. And he walks up Golgotha, enduring under a cross that he should not bear, with blood pouring off him that should not be pouring out of him, enduring faith. See, endurance is a challenge in our trial to our world. I want to speak my fourth point is this, healed in hardship. Hebrews 12 continues and God is speaking about the God, the loving Father who disciplines his children. It says that discipline is a gift from a good father. It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves. And he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. And then I saw this amazing line. It says, so discipline is a gift of a father who loves his children. This is not punishment. This is discipline. Another way of saying discipling into our future, into everything God has for us. And then the very next scripture is this. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. I, I think that's amazing. It says, for what children are not being disciplined by their parents? And it continues in verse 12. It says this, strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees. Your arms feeling a bit feeble. You couldn't lift much now. You feel like you've been lifting a lot. Your legs tight. It says, make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. And I want to end here. Endure hardship as discipline. In John 16, Jesus speaking, I've told you these things so that you may, in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome this world. When you stay in me, you'll have peace. But you can stay in me in this world of trouble, and when you stay in me, you'll know that I've overcome the world. See, too many Christians read about suffering and enduring hardship, and they go, that's a good story for that person. 
They really, in their discipleship journey, they need a good dose of suffering and hardship. They need a good dose of, of just challenge, just to toughen them up a little bit. We, we say these things, but when we don't say them, we think them at times. We think, it's good for someone else. That scripture, that one's really good for Bob. I mean, Bob needs that scripture. No, this scripture is for every person saying, endure hardship. That word endure is a hupomino, meaning it, it's like a military term to, to hold a position, an important position that cannot be given away. If you let go of that position, you need to hold it with such confidence that you will not lose it. There's a holding the position. He says, endure, hold your position. You don't need to take ground in times of hardship. You need to hold your position with a confidence in the victory that is found in Jesus. And then it says, endure hardship. That word hardship is a word that called padea. It's, it's referring to the education of disciples that we endure hardship. And God will use tough, hard scenarios to educate us as disciples of Jesus. Saying as you hold your position with a confidence in the living God who is high above, amidst the challenge and the trial and the suffering, God is training you. God is fashioning you. He's molding you. He's speaking to you. He's committed to you. Because discipline produces disciples. And when we endure hardship, you see, you can endure hardship as many things. The Bible says endure hardship as discipline. You can endure it as persecution. And you'll go, woe is me, I'm being persecuted. You can do that now. And you'll find a million reasons why you are being persecuted. And you will so elevate the enemy and his position in all of this, you'll only see him. Or you'll, you'll say, actually, endure hardship as punishment. I'm being punished. I, I'm bad. I'm being punished, and I deserve this punishment. No, then you're acting as an orphan, not a son who's been redeemed and paid for by the living God and the blood of his son. You'll endure hardship as some kind of sick pleasure of the enemy. No, it says endure hardship as discipline. See, maybe 2020 is just a ship that we're in, and it's hard. I'm that simple. It's just a hard Ship to be in. Things are tough. 2020 is tough. It's going to be tough. It's not getting better tomorrow. But I have a peace. And I love the way it ends. And this is where I want to land because I think this is the most powerful part of all of it. In verse 12, therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level the paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled but rather healed. He says, on the other side of this enduring hardship as discipline, there's a loving father who doesn't want your weak arms and your weak knees to see you disabled in the fight. He wants to do a miracle. He wants to heal you. He wants to use you to heal the nations of the world. He wants to do signs and wonders, bring glory to his name. On the other side of engaging and enduring hardship, of being trained and holding our position, there are signs and wonders in the hardship. I want to see signs and wonders. See, I've seen signs and wonders in the good times, in comfortable church buildings, but sometimes the greatest signs and wonders are when the battle's on and he's calling us. See, the greatest challenge to the believer in 2020 is not economic crisis, it's not health, it's not salary reductions. The greatest challenge is there's a great cloud of witnesses who've had very big testimonies in their life. And I said it earlier, I mean, I think a guy like Samson, he's had his eyes gouged out, he's going, well, you're moaning about what? You can't go get coffee when? Think about David, and he lived in caves for years, the anointed king living in caves, having mad Saul chasing him. What about Sarah and the shame, the shame on her of not being able to have a child, but trusting God, trusting God. See, how did these great cloud of witnesses do it? Number one, they had a heavenly hope. What's your hope right now? Bank accounts, interest rates dropping, share prices, a loan from a bank. They understood that suffering was a part of this life. And too much of the church never speaks about it. It's the, it's the S word we can't say in church, but the Bible speaks a whole lot about it. Yes, even in the New Testament. Why? Because we've got Jesus. It says, and then calls us to enduring faith. Not fair with the faith, but enduring faith. These guys, the Hebrews 11 heroes of the faith, they had enduring faith that went beyond the norm. And then lastly, they found healing in the hardship. 
And we can too. And we can be a part of being a healing story and seeing signs and wonders come in the middle as God educates us through something called hardship. You can make it something else. You can make it perseverance. Yeah, persecution. You can make it conspiracy. I would just call it what the Bible calls it, hardship. And then I would do what the Bible says, endure hardship as discipline. But you know the amazing thing, and this is where I want to draw us a little closer and pray for us. There's going to be some scars in hardship, in trial, and in suffering. Jesus comes back to his disciples. He says, sure, see my scars. He says, put your finger here and see my hands. And put out your hand and place it in the inside mind. He said, do not disbelieve, but believe. Jesus shows them his scars. There's some scars that are going to come. Maybe some will lose homes and businesses and dreams that they'll have to lay down now. But I want to tell you two things about our Savior today. Number one, He knows your pain. He walked up that hill at Golgotha. He had those nails put in His hands. He cried out to the Father, Father, could you take this away from me? And maybe you're crying that same prayer. That's okay. But if we just left it there and that was the end of the story, we'd have no hope. But we have a great hope because our final victory is in the one who bears our scars. The one who takes away the scars of shame and guilt at this time and the father who can't provide for his family right now. God is saying, I will carry you. It's my scars that will take away your scars and your guilt and your shame. If you will trust me, if you will endure just a little bit longer, if you will stand and hold the position with a mindset and a knowledge that my God is on his throne, our final victory is in him, the lamb who was slain. I want to pray for you today. I'm praying for me. But as we pray, will you close your eyes? Will you just see his scars now on his hands, his side? Then will you hear the shouts of the great cloud of witnesses? You can do it. You can do it. He's with you. It's hard, but he's with you. It's overwhelming, but he's with you. feels sore, but He's with you. Fix your eyes. Take your eyes off. Take your eyes off. Place your eyes on Jesus. See His scars and know that He has won the battle for you today. If you haven't given your life to Jesus today, make a decision today to take His pain, His scars that He bore for you on and receive His grace, His redemption, His power to set you free today. And if you're saying, Mark, I can't get away from the questions, I can't still my mind, find peace in a posture of enduring faith with the knowledge that there will be healing on the other side of this hardship because God is faithful and He is kind. God, bless your people up, bro. Be with us. Show us, Spirit of God, reveal to us enduring faith, reveal to us power in this time and reveal to us the healing you wanna do. And I pray, God, bless your people as we endure, as we hold the position you call us to hold at this time, however we find ourselves and wherever we find ourselves. We declare again, we trust you, we love you, and we fix our eyes on you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Once again, we love you. God bless you. Let's worship with one more song as we go into this amazing week. Spirit, lead me where my trust is with our borders. Let me walk upon the Wherever you will call me Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander And my faith will be made stronger In the presence of my Savior Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders 
my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. We're strong in your presence. We're strong in your presence. You call me out. Oh, you call me out. I'm strong in your presence. Let's sing Spirit one more time. for joining us for church today. It was such a privilege to host you. Yeah. If you were with us for the very first time online, we want to say welcome. And we have got something called an online guest card that you can get access to yeah. on our website or on lifechangeschurch.tv. We'd love to invite you to fill that out and we'll send you yeah. some more information about who we are as a church and how you can get connected at this time. Or you can join us for a life group live where we yeah. stay connected during the week make new friends and where we connect even though we can't see each other like we normally do. Yeah. We also want to have an opportunity to give and partner in the gospel. Yeah. So you can join us on our website, click the give tab yeah. where you can partner with us. Can, I can't believe we're at the end of our meeting. Did you enjoy it, Michael? I loved it. Come Wasn't on. it amazing? Yeah, I loved it. And oh, it really word. was a privilege to Best have you time. with us. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook or subscribe on our YouTube yeah. channel where you'll be able to get access to all of our past content. And we've got some really exciting things coming up in the next week or so where, and we'll be releasing info about those. So follow yeah. us. It was a privilege to have you with us. We love you. We're praying for you. Have an incredible week.